In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, Mary. Blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners now. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, it instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit. Grant us by the same Spirit may be truly wise and ever rejoice in this consolation to the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Lady of Sorrows, St. Joseph, Father Lanteri, St. Ignatius, all God's angels and saints, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Brief catechesis is the following, a short prayer that most of you know. And this prayer comes from St. Francis of Assisi, who suffered the stigmata of Christ, as did Padre Pio. The prayer is, we adore you, Christ, and we bless you because by your holy cross you've redeemed the world. That's St. Francis. So that's our catechesis, to try to say that prayer during the course of the day. We adore you, Christ, and we bless you because by your cross you have redeemed the world. You may be walking from one place to another. You may be praying that prayer. So you're creating the, the mood of this, this day of the exercises. To start out with a, an anecdote, a few years back, we had the head of a group called Barrios Per Cristo, and that group is designed at helping to reform gang members, cholos. And um, wine gardens in the past is known to be one of the most highly infested gang cities in LA for many years. Now a little bit less, but uh, pretty well known for gang activity. So this head of the group, Body of Procristo, came and had a conversation with me and Father Larry in our, in our rectory. We had, we had lunch with him. He asked us this question, how can we reform gang members? And he said, well, give them retreats if they're open to that. And that's right up our alley, we give retreats. Then the head of the group said, who gives the talks? And me and Father Larry said, well, we could probably give the talks because we give retreats. He said, no. And we said, well, who would give the retreats? The mothers of the gang members. Why? Because the gang members have been kicked around like dogs and they're kicking other people out like dogs and shooting and this and that. But the gang members know that there's one person that loves them on planet Earth and it's their mother. And they know that. They know that. So imagine a group of 25 gang members, tough looking guys, you know, with, with their tattoos and their bald head and their white shirts and their baggy pants. I know what they look, and their sunglasses, no? <laughs> I've been around the gardens for a long time, no? And imagine the mother getting up 
And she's not a professional teacher either. Maybe tripping over words, concepts. And there she is, her son, six foot three, 250 pounds, with tattoos from his eyebrows to the, his toes. And she's just talking spontaneously. There's my son, and I love him. She gets up, gives him a hug, and the toughest guy in LA breaks into tears. Not because the eloquence of the mother, but by the love that the mother showed by suffering. That's the introduction to my talk today. How do we know someone loves us? By the willingness to suffer for us. That's Faustina, but I think it's common sense. When you know someone that has really suffered a lot for you, whether the person says it explicitly, articulates it with words, doesn't really matter. You know that. I think the nine members in my family, we have a great love for my mother because we know that she suffered for us. None of you have nine kids? No, it's a, it's a big... Yeah. They had four teenage boys, at the, four teenagers at the same time. You can't even imagine that. Four teenage boys. I was one of them. I was number two, no? <laughs> When you have someone that's willing to suffer, you know that that person loves. So I'm giving you a human analogy to arrive at the most sublime, and it's Jesus, how much he suffered for us. Now, as Eric said earlier, is we're begging for the grace as Father Victor said last night, to be willing to suffer. Willing to suffer for Christ and with Christ. I would use those two prepositions, both the for Christ as well as with Christ. And of course, this goes against human nature, and every time this part of the retreat comes, I want to go on vacation, no? <laughs> because it's hard to suffer. It's hard to preach on this topic, too. I, I cringe, you know, I kind of recoil. But I know that that's my own cowardice and the bad spirit working on me. Is we, we have to confront the reality of the cross. I mean, as Fulton Sheen says in his typical eloquence, there's no resurrection. There's no Easter Sunday without the Good Friday. It's the totality of the Paschal mystery. Ignatius also underlines this. There are I'm not a sociology major, but I think there's about 7.5 billion in the world, something like that. I think a little, little bit beyond the 7 billion. If you are the only person in the world, Jesus would have suffered his passion for you. And a thousand times. With all of our studies as priests, seminarians, priests, theologians, many years we have to study. What touches me most as a priest and religious is what I'm saying right now. The fact that Jesus suffered all these excruciating pains for Father Broom as if I were the only person in the world. That's what touches me most.
of all the different ideas we have in theology and the Bible. The fact that he, as Paul says, he loved me and gave himself up for me. Galatians, right? And he says that to you right now. That's what motivates the saints to do great things, to make enormous sacrifices, to walk the extra mile, to endure sufferings that, that on a human level are impossible, is the love of Christ. St. Paul says, the love of Christ compels me on. So, your biblical passages today, I'm going to give you a lot and you choose whatever you want. I'll give you the biblical passages, passages of the Passion of Christ. In all the four Gospels, all the four Gospels, you have two long chapters on the Passion of Christ. In the Resurrection, you only have one except the Gospel of St. John, who's got two on the Passion of Christ and two on the Resurrection. But all the Gospels have two long chapters on the Passion of Christ. So you can choose whichever ones you want. I'll, I'll give them to you. So Matthew 26, 27. Mark 14, 15, Luke 22, 23, and John 18, 19. So there you have the eight chapters of the Passion of Christ. There's, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. From moving from the Last Supper to the garden all the way up until when Jesus, his uh, heart is pierced with a lance. During the course of the exercises, Saint Ignatius invite you to pray over these three questions related to the cross. I invite you to bring this into your contemplations. Before Jesus crucified, the three questions are related to three moments of time, past, present, and future. And this is done, Ignatius says, this should be done before the cross. Did you ever notice the difference between a Protestant crucifix and a Catholic crucifix? It's interesting, isn't it? What's the difference? They don't have the corpus. Usually there's just a cross, but there's no one on it. My friends, that does nothing to me anyway. I don't know about you. It doesn't do anything to me. But if you look up at that cross, or the cross that you see in our church on the wall, or in my confessional, uh, you got the body there. In my confession, you can see the blood it was much worse than that. The passion of Christ is, you know, is the best thing to see if we really want to go deep into the passion of Christ. But Ignatius says, he asks us this, these three questions. What have I done for Christ?
Second, what am I doing for Christ now? The third is, what will I do for Christ? So it's past, present, and future. Ignatius of Loyola has a very laconic style. Laconic means very concise style in the exercises. But it's packed with meaning. You could spend your whole holy hour just on that one question before the cross. What have I done for Christ? What am I doing now? What will I do in the future? Maybe my past life has been a checkered life in which I've committed a lot of sins. Maybe right now, okay, you're here in the retreat. Probably saying, well, I'm here in the retreat. I'm, I'm giving the Lord of myself. But the future, could you give more? Could you give more? Or you're already giving your best. We can always be giving more. The dynamic of the exercises should be the dynamic of your life. Here's a big college word for you. Magnanimity. Magnanimous. Not pusillanimity. Magnanimity means a growing generosity. Now you should be at your apex. Huh? You should be at your zenith. You should be at your high point in the passion of Christ, as you look up at Christ on the cross. What have I done for Christ? Well, maybe before doing the spiritual exercises with me, maybe you weren't a villain. But maybe you are mediocre. Maybe you are mediocre. As they say in Italian, no faccia male a nessuno, no mazzo, no rubo. No faccia male a nessuno, no mazzo, no rubo. Any of you speak Italian? I don't do, I don't do evil to anyone. I don't kill and I don't rob. As they say in Chile, soy gallo bueno. I'm a good person. Maybe that was your past. I'm just, uh, I, don't, I don't do any evil to anyone. One occasion someone died and he went before Peter and he said to Peter, well, I haven't done anything evil to anyone. And Peter said, go down and do good and then kind of come up. Okay? <laughs> it's not enough simply to avoid doing evil. We've got to do good. We should expend ourselves doing as much good as we possibly can while we have the opportunity. Amen? Amen? Who knows, maybe in three or four years one of us will be in a wheelchair. We don't know. Do you prefer to be in the wheelchair or pushing the wheelchair? Hello? I think so. While we have an opportunity to do good, let's do good. And may the passion of Christ motivate us. Can the way of the cross, that's the meditation for day, today, the way of the cross, Father Victor this morning gave a contemplation on the 
passion of John the Baptist very much the way Fulton Sheen does it in the passion. In which he pointed out the different characters surrounding the passion of John the Baptist. I think that's a good bridge to entering the passion because you're going to be noticing a lot of different characters in the passion of Christ. Actually, this morning I was doing some work and I, I, was, I wrote down 20, pe 20 different people in the Passion of Christ. 20 different. And there were even more. And each one of those symbolizes a certain character or disposition of heart in which we can identify ourselves with some of these characters in the Passion of Christ. Even though we don't want to admit it, but we're going to sometimes see certain individuals in the Passion of Christ were not really that good. Well, I've seen myself in that person in the past. Maybe even now. Maybe now. But I'd like to pull out uh, one person in the way of the cross and speak a few minutes on that person and you can pray to the Holy Spirit to move you in the right direction. It doesn't take one, one person. And if you've seen the movie The Passion of Christ, it, Mel Gibson does a really good depiction of this person. It's a secondary character, but man, Gibson hit the nail on the head. And it's Simon of Cyrene. Yeah. Any of you see the Passion of the Christ? Yes. Do you remember Simon of Cyrene, how Gibson presents him? Man. I was really touched the way he was presented. So let's speak a minute or two on him and, and maybe see if we've got this Simon of Serene within us. And you can even have a parallel between Simon of Serene, Serene and the Good Samaritan. I think they're very synonymous in many respects. Okay, Jesus is carrying the cross. The cross is very heavy. Jesus is almost on the point of exhaustion. He can barely carry the cross by himself anymore. The Roman soldiers are aware of this, and not out of compassion, not out of the compassion, but simply because they want him to make it to the top of the hill. Don't think that that's compassion. So this man seems to come out of nowhere his name is Simon, from the town of Serene. We're, we'll meet his two sons, Alexander and Rufus, later on. And I, I, I like the way he's depicted because the Roman soldiers, they're looking around and this guy, he's got big, broad so, should, uh, shoulders. They grab onto him. What is his initial reaction? He does not want to carry that cross. He does not want to carry the cross. Now, if you've seen the film of Father Patrick Payton, have you seen that? Pay Payton pre presents in a little different way. Simon says to, to the Roman soldiers, he says, you made the, car you made the cross, you carry it. <laughs> That's what you have in Patrick Payton's film. But in the film of Gibson, you just see the resistance. He doesn't want to carry that cross. So let me ask this question. Do you sometimes resist in wanting to carry your cross? That's why this one figure you could spend the re probably the rest of this day just on that one idea. 
how rich the passion of Christ is. Simon did not want to carry the cross and sometimes we say, I don't want to carry my cross. Why do I have to have this cross? Give it to my husband. Why do I have to carry this cross? <laughs> Give it to my sister. Why do I have to carry this cross? We suffer from complainitis, right? It's a modern malady in the modern world, complainitis. We're always complaining. And as the poet says, as the poet says, I complained because I had no shoes until I met someone without any feet. Amen? We always meet someone that has less than us. So Simon, Simon resists. And we resist. We run away from the cross. And you know when we run away from the cross and we look for another cross, the cross that, the other cross that we look for is heavier than the cross that the Lord wanted to give us. Maybe you've heard the expression, the grass is always green or on the other side of the fence, huh? If only I were living a hundred years earlier. If only I married another person. If only I had a different profession. If only the sun were coming out now. If only, if only, if only. That comes from the devil. It does. It's whimsical, wishful thinking that's never going to happen. So in carrying your cross, I'd like to give you one more verse. And see if you can identify yourself with Simon of Cyrene. And once he says yes to the cross, remember the film of Gibson, once he says yes to the cross, he's the most valiant and courageous helper of Christ all the way up to Calvary. With Veronica and the Holy Women, and of course the Blessed Mother and John, but he is valiantly defending the Lord. When the Lord is falling, they're whipping him, He's defending the Lord. Then what touches me most in the whole scene of Gibson is, maybe you probably don't even remember this, is that the arm of Christ was intertwined, okay, with that of Simon. That's what touched me most. They're, they're interlocked. Do I even remember that? Yes. They're, they're intertwined, they're interlocked. That says so much. Christ wants to intertwine himself with you. I am the vine and you're the branches, right? John 15. Now carrying our cross, we all suffer in carrying our cross, but let me tell you the secret. Let me give you another biblical verse which is not directly related, related to the passion, but indirectly yes. And this has been one of my top biblical verses all my life. Matthew 11, 28 to 30, which is Come to me, all of you are weary. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me. 
because I am meek and humble of heart. For you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I think if you add that to this day, it's going to, I don't want to say soften the blow, but it, it, it'll help us, help us to go through this difficult day better. Now, I've always been a city boy. I don't know if I've ever really seen the yoke, but I have a lot of common sense. What is a yoke? In Spanish, yugo. Okay, what is it? You've got an ox, plural would be oxen, right? And you've got this heavy apparatus. Probably if you come from Mexico, you've probably seen that. Uh, or maybe even here, uh, or the Philippines. These huge beasts of burden, they've got this apparatus fastened to their back. And the, uh, the farmer has to direct the ox or the oxen. But what's, what's paradoxical, what's paradoxical is, Jesus says, my yoke, yeah, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's paradoxical. Because the yoke is the exact opposite. These are the words I use, it's cumbersome. Cumbersome means it's uncomfortable to be able to adjust it perfectly. And it's heavy. So why does Jesus say that? Doesn't it seem to be contradictory to what a farmer knows about the beast of burden, the oxen? What Jesus is really saying is that if you carry the cross by yourself, the cross is going to crush you. But if you carry the cross with Christ, he makes your cross lighter. And you can carry it with Christ. As Simon carried it with Christ, so can you. And so can I. And never forget, the last word is not death, but the last word is Jesus is truly risen from the dead. So beyond the Good Friday that we're meditating today, in the pale glimmer of dawn, we have the risen Jesus awaiting for all of us. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, and bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit.